set five, Team Fight Tactics Reckoning, was probably the worst TFT set of all time. Now, if you were to just pull someone randomly off the street uh, and ask them, hey, what's the worst set of TFT of all time? They probably wouldn't know what the hell you're talking about. They probably wouldn't play TFT. But if you were to pull a random TFT player off the street and ask them, hey, what's the worst TFT set of all time? Anyone who's been playing since, like, you know, uh, set two onward at least would almost certainly answer set five. I don't know about set one. I've heard it was kind of crazy. Um, but set five was a special kind of messed up. Uh, there were a whole lot of bugs. There were a whole lot of balance issues. And the set mechanic itself was the craziest thing we had seen to date. And we, we had seen and we have seen to date probably. And how it affected the game and how hard it made the game to balance. Um, so, you know, if you think like, like TFT has balance issues now, which I mean, we are, we are so lucky compared to what it could have been, right? What was at some point, the game has come a long way and the devs have come a long way in making the game as good as it is. Uh, so I thought it'd be fun to just like go back and look at old TFT sets. I figured we'd start from the bottom because I like talking about set five. There was some wacky stuff going on and we're going to just kind of jump, jump right in. So, uh, first and foremost, what was the set mechanic? Slash, what is a set mechanic, I guess? Set mechanics are kind of the things that differentiate sets, right? Uh, set three had galaxies, which was that every single game you would spawn in uh, and it'd be a different effect for the game, right? It would be like everyone starts with a four cost this game, or it would be uh, everyone gets a force of nature this game. Uh, kind of similar to how portals work right now in current TFT. Um, you know, set, set 11's encounter, or... Uh, mechanic for example some mechanic is encounters where like every little bit in a game you get some random effects some random wacky effect or sometimes Kane pops up on 2-1 and then you're like oh my god the game's gonna end at 5-4 I'm gonna die so all kinds of stuff like that right it's kind of the stuff that gives the the set it's it's meat that gives the set its identity and so set 5 set mechanic was insane and so here's what it was right you see all these items and we'll go through some of the older items too, because those are fun to reminisce about. And you're like, oh, what are these what are these green items here? And then you realize there's another tab. Shadow items. So <laughs> you might be asking yourself a couple things. One, what the hell is a shadow item? Two, how do they get a shadow item? And three, how are they different from normal items? So shadow items were items, it's like a whole other set of items in, in the game. Every single every single foot item you, full item you could make had a shadow item counterpart. So, you know, Death Blade, right here, there's a shadow Death Blade. Guardian Angel, right here, also missed that item. I still call Edge of Night GA, it just feels right. There was a shadow GA. Uh, so, same thing with spats too, right? So, normal spatula, and these days show up all the time. Uh, shadow spatula, it must do something evil. It says and oh god did it um if you have ever taken if you played in set 9 i don't think it's actually in set 11 set 9 or set 10 uh or basically anytime since set 6 i think this has been the game uh, there's an augment called um what is it a uh, cursed crown and that started here with force of darkness where you get two force of natures for the price of one you get two unit slots two uh what's it called now Titian's crowns for one spat and one shadow spat. The same thing, you could be shadow spat and shadow spat um, as well. And you would get a, you, so you get two spats, or you get two unit slots, but you would take 100% more damage every time you lost a fight. And this is, I think, very indicative of what shadow items were. So shadow items were very, very powerful effects with very, very large downsides. Although in some cases, which we'll get to, those downsides could be avoided and they just became very broken items. Very, very broken items, even just abused, honestly. Uh, so yeah, that, that's what shadow item was. Basically how it, what worked is that if I had a shadow sword plus a shadow chain, it would make shadow guardian angel. If I had normal sword plus a shadow chain, it would still make shadow guardian angel. So the only way to make a normal item was to get a, um, was to get two normal components to make the full item. Any way, the way to get a shadow item was to get any shadow component plus a normal item or a shadow item plus a shadow component. Uh, and then you'd make the shadow item. And I think they would just drop off creep rounds, if I remember correctly. I think you get them from um, from anvils as well. I think it, this is the first time that anvils would ever drop, um, like component anvils and stuff. And so, you know, you can make all, you can make every single spat in the game, which is really cool. Uh, in current TFT, right, you have a, a set of uncraftable spats that 
and fast uncraftable trait spats where like you can't um you can't make like what were some examples from the current set right uh i guess it doesn't matter because who knows when you're watching this but basically this is the first time TV sister you can make every spat you didn't have to get like a tome or anything to, to get it you could just make it and so all kinds of stuff opened up um so first and foremost i want to look at some of the most broken shadow item effects and how they were abused right because i also just go through some over some general effects to get it give a better feel for it right i think the force of darkness gives a very good idea of what to expect from a shadow item but there's stuff like uh Oh, we're going to talk about this in a second, but Sacrificial Gauntlet, which is basically just Jeweled Gauntlet, but you get even more damage, and every single time you cast, you do damage to yourself. Uh, there's something like Shadow Rage Blade, which says, attacks give you bonus attack speed per auto, but you lose 2.5% of your max HP every time you auto attack, right? Um, so some crazy stuff like that. One of the craziest ones maybe being like Frozen Dark Heart, where it was, you know, it was double the range of a normal Frozen Heart, which... This is an item of the game right now. What it did, what Normal Frozen Heart did. I can even just read it to you right now. It said, reduce the attack speed of enemies uh, within two hexes by 25%. And so Shadow One says, it increases, decreases attack speed by even more than that, 35%. But allies within one hex also get attack speed reduced. So, ow, that, that would not be good. This item was very heavily abused. Uh, same with Normal Frozen Heart. We'll get to that. But uh, just, just as far as the set mechanic goes, there was some crazy shit going on. Uh, I think one of the best examples I can give you of how crazy this set was with these shadow items is the notorious shadow blue buff. Now, if you've ever heard anything about set five, you've probably heard about shadow blue buff. And so what it says is a very dark blue buff. After casting their ability, the holder gains 15 mana. If the holder has less than 60% health, this is increased to 50. And so this interacts with two units in a very, very, very unbalanceable, very uncool way. And so, putting up the unit set, unit list here, right? The first set of the units was LeBlanc. And so she had 60 mana, and she said uh, she launches chains of the two nearest enemies, it deals damage to them, and after a little bit of delay, it stuns them for a pretty healthy amount of time. And so what you would do is you would put Shadow Blue Buff on LeBlanc, you put Guardian Angel on LeBlanc, because if you look at Guardian Angel real quick, it says you get revived with 400 HP. And I'll tell you what, 400 HP is less than 40% of your max HP. So what would happen is she would jump to the back, she'd get targeted, she was an assassin. Um, so she would jump to the back, she would get targeted, and then she would proc her guardian angel. And with shadow blue buff, she would auto once, and she would make two chains pop out. And then she'd auto once to make two chains pop out, and auto once to make two chains pop out. And they did a lot of damage and they stunned for a long time. So you would perma stun the board. You would perma stun their back line. You would kill everything. You'd heal infinite. Because uh, you'd always go like healing. And I think Coven might have had healing built in. I can check actually. I'm not super sure. I don't quite remember. Uh, nope. Just um, it just gave them some some uh, bonus ability power and then like a mana chain effect. But the, basically the, the essential piece of this con to understand is that she would just cast infinitely basically and it was very easy to make get that condition that you needed to get uh shadow blue buff working because guardian angel just had such an insane interaction with it and the even more oppressive version of this because there was a more oppressive version of this and that was with rise uh so rise says rise imprisons the nearest enemy dealing magic damage and stunning them for a while his next cast spreads from his target applying the same damage and half the stun to all enemies in a large area around the target so Basically, every other cast, you get a massive AoE damage and stun. Every, I mean, I guess every other cast as well, you get just a big stun on, the, on one target. But he's also a 50 mana. And so if you had Ray, or Shadow Blue Buff, and you had uh, Guardian Angel on a Rise, even like an Assassin Spat or something, right? Because you can make every single spat. You can make Assassin Spat. Rise would basically just perma cast and stun the entire board infinitely, killing everyone just just straight up killing everyone this unit with guardian angel and shadow blue buff was probably the most broken thing i can remember in tft's history uh like it was the least fun thing to play around so that was the biggest like most obvious insane example of what shadow items could do i think there was one that stands out to me more because this actually almost made me quit tft it was so insane it was a uh, sacrificial gauntlet which just talked about its interaction with vein so right, this says you get a bunch of extra damage, but every time you, um, every time you cast, you take a percent of your max HP or a percent of your max of mana as damage to yourself. Basically, you get you hurt yourself for casting, but you get a lot of benefit from that. But there was a unit in the set who didn't need to cast. 
And what that unit was, was Vayne. So what Vayne says is, uh, Vayne's third attack on a target deals bonus true damage. And this worked with Runans back, back in the day as well. So you could go normal Runans, plus Radiant Jewel, or Shadow Jewel Gauntlet. I keep saying Radiant because Radiant items are set 5.5. So you could go Shadow Jewel Gauntlet, plus Runans, and all of a sudden your Vayne would have, your Vayne 1 would be out DPSing like four costs. She's a one cost, by the way. So basically every every uh, third attack, she'd be doing like two or 300 true damage to two different targets. You'd go double, the real build was like double Runans, Radiant Jewel Gauntlet, or Shadow Jewel Gauntlet, and you would just blow up boards. And there was a game I remember very, um, very particularly that a Vayne 1, I think it just might've been in a tournament, um, Milk played Vayne 1 to a game win. He had items on the vein one the entire game. This one star, one cost, and he won the game off of it. Because there's just nothing better with it. It was just so insane, the interaction. Um, even so, so even like getting up beyond the shadow item interactions, and just to show how crazy some interactions were in this set, you had uh, this shadow frozen heart as well as normal frozen heart on Diana. And so Diana was maybe the least fun unit in the set which with the rise with, with like rise existing is an insane thing to say but so diana was an assassin she would jump to the back line and she would basically after eight autos less if you have tier have have tears on her and fun fact frozen heart gives you a lot of mana it has tier i think it actually gives you more mana as well than like a tier would if i'm not mistaken i'm not positive about that but Basically, she would jump to the back. If she was on your carries, they couldn't play the game because they'd be frozen hearted, losing a ton of attack speed, and then she would cast, they would all die. It was just an absolute shit show. And obviously the frozen heart downside, the shadow frozen heart downside doesn't matter if she's in their back line. So basically what it, it created was like this, this weird 50-50 positioning thing where like you were either on hard right side or hard wrong side. And if you got the 50-50 wrong, the Diana player would just destroy you. And if you got it right, then you'd probably be fine and just destroy them. So it was just, a little toxic. Um, there was also stuff like uh, Locket of the Silver Lunari uh, Radiant, or sorry, Shadow um, Shadow Locket. And what this did is said, you gain less mana with your attacks, but you gain an insane amount of armor and MR. There's actually a similar thing with Zeke's where it said one unit gets 40% attack speed for each affected unit, um, for each unit on the left or right of it. And those units get less attack speed. And so what these were basically was that they were, they were aura items with like these big downsides that really could be avoided super easily. And so walk it, you just, you know, if you have a bunch of units on your front line who don't need to cast or like cast from getting, uh, or don't cast from attacking, right? Like these big tanks. Um, I think the tanks in the set were like Rel. Uh, there was, this was in like the very degenerate time of t like TFT comp naming where uh, it was called HIV, Heimer, Heimer Ivern Volley was like one of the big comps where you just play like Ivern, Five cost Heimer and Volibear, which and they were just your your big revenant front line who would like stay alive and cast a bunch and um, Heimer being a backliner I guess, but Ivern and Volley being the big frontliners and they would just get a lot of value. Um, but basically, you could have like a total crap front line that didn't really care about auto attacking to get casts off, just like getting hit to get casts off with triple locket, and you would just they would take no damage at all, absolutely none, because they don't care about auto attacking, right? They get plenty of mana from getting hit. You can basically make like an unkillable frontline. Similar thing with Shadow Zeke's. I say similar, it's slightly different, but like this downside of, you know, things getting minus 3% attack speed doesn't really matter when the holder gets 80%. So if you put that on a Vayne, if you had Runan's Shadow Zeke's Shadow Dra Jewel Gauntlet Vayne 1, she has plus 80% attack speed, which is insane. She has like 200 true damage on like every third auto, which is disgusting. And then she also has... You know she's hitting two things at once with that true damage so it would just be bonkers bonkers insane it was it was not super fun to play against uh, i don't think there were any other super crazy shadow item effects if i remember correctly there was what well, this is why my favorite shadow item um just to reminisce a little bit was rapid fire death cannon a rapid death cannon and so you could play like a social distancing comp this was during code the height of covid not that we're not in there still but like during the height of quarantine in the US at least. And so I like to call it social distancing Yasuo. And so you would go, uh, you would go RFC, 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 or Shadow RFC Yasuo. And basically he would get like a ton of extra range and then you wouldn't have anyone next to him. So we, what this says is that if anyone's not next to you, you get a bunch of bonus attack speed. But if anyone's next to you, then you lose that. And so you would just get a ton of value by just having this like Yasuo in the corner, this melee unit in the corner with like five hex range just killing everything. It was so funny. Um, 
cool. It was a nice little comp. There, there were certainly, I think it has to be said that there were a lot of fun things in this set too, like a lot of fun shadow animal reactions. Uh, there were just a lot of degenerate ones that overshadowed them. So, uh, those are some of the most broken interactions, and so some of the comps those led to, right? Which I think is uh, is an important thing to talk about, because there were some really bad ones. Uh, first and foremost, I want to talk about the comp that, again, almost made me quit TFT, which was the Forgotten comp. And so what Forgotten does is it says, Forgotten champions have bonus attack damage and ability power. Each shadow item held by a Forgotten champion increases the bonuses by 15% on all Forgotten champions, stacking up to four times. So basically, you get a bunch of stats. Um, and you get rewarded for having a bunch of shadow items. And mostly, it's just that you have a bunch of these units that are like whatever units with, with good stats. But the problem with this is that not only is Vayne in this synergy, but Rise is in this synergy. And there's two two cost frontliners that were both very potent. One being a hook that I I cannot stress enough how broken this two cost thresh was because he has the Blitzcrank hook effect, but he doesn't have max mana to start the fight. So you pretty much had to have some kind of random four range synergy bot in your back or left in the back corner next to your carry. Otherwise, you were guaranteed to get Blitzcrank hooked. Basically, is is what it was. So it was very degenerate, uh, this, this Thresh. And so you'd have that in the same comp as Vayne with the crazy interactions and how broken she was. It's the same comp with Ryze who had some crazy stuff going on. So it was just like probably the my least favorite comp of all time. And the problem was that it was played by like a bunch of people every single game because all you had to do to play it was full open stage two. And then you would roll the zero on three two and you would just play six forgotten. And that's it. That was the whole board. You, you generally hit these six. If you hit one of the four costs, oh my god, you're chilling. And then you're fine. Right? Like, often, Draven 1 was, like, worse than Vayne 1, which is insane to think about. Uh, Nightbringer was actually pretty cool. Uh, it had Yasuo in it, which maybe one of my favorite units of all time was this Nightbringer Legionary Yasuo, who was basically just... He would just auto-attack a lot and do a bunch of true damage as well. He's basically just Vayne, but mostly balanced, I would say. He was cool. He had, like, stacking true damage. He was, he was very neat. Um, did have one of the worst five costs of all time, I will say. Uh, there was this cool dynamic in set five of like the good guys versus the bad guys, right? Uh, of Nightbringers, in this situation it was Nightbringers versus Dawnbringers, and it was this big God King Garen versus this big God King Darius. And the, you know, the problem with that was that Garen was cool. He was a good unit. He had this big AOE ult that did damage. In Darius, what he did is he he jumped up. And he just kind of stood back down. He didn't do anything. He, he like, sent out some wolves that, like, healed him a little bit and did, like, a tiny bit of damage and armor pen. He didn't he didn't really do anything. He would pretty much always get farmed by Garen. It was weird. It was very weird. And he was not very good. <laughs> um, that being said, again, there were some good parts of set 5. Uh, Teemo was a sick 5 cost. He was the first and only unit in TFT's history to be bought with HP rather than gold. And so you would, you could buy, you could sell him for five gold, but he would be bought for six HP. And Teemo too was a beast. Uh, he was the first instance as well. So right now with Lissandra, if Lissandra ever casts on like the last unit left on the board, it just dies, right? It, it like, like just gets executed. Teemo has like the cruel trait, which said if it was ever Teemo plus one unit left on the board, the other unit just got like sucked into hell and died. It was crazy. And so people would go like, blue buff Morello's uh, with with GA on their Teemo, and then he would just like kill whatever the last unit was, and it was very cool. He was a sick unit. Um, there were also like some other misses, right? Like this Kale was good for like two seconds in the set. She was the same thing at Kale always is this big ascension machine, but didn't do super well. But that is a back to comps. Um, I think a bomb was maybe, it had his moments where it was like really, really broken. Again, it has rise in it and then like, it had this weird moment for a while where like you just go full ad a bomb and it would just go to your back it was basically what it did is it summoned this big scion that would run your opponent's back line and just whack them a bunch and like cc a bunch of things and so it could just one shot an entire board basically like kill the entire back line on its own so that was pretty not cool for a bit uh <laughs> it was it was a comp you'd see most games and it was not the most dribble thing to play against this was also uh, there's there's a clip up there somewhere which I, I think you should definitely, if you have any interest in, in set five, or you have any nostalgia for it, like I do, I say I have nostalgia for it. I have like nightmares about it, but maybe in a good way. Um, definitely recommend going in, looking back at some of these old units and watching videos of them. Cause there's a video of this trundle who would basically just like suck up the stats of a, a, opponent units and go crazy with them. There's a clip of this trundle 
just killing like an entire board on his own. I think like a trundle one like absorbs the right like like just the right thing, and then he just literally kills everything. Um, it, it it was a pretty crazy unit. Diana was in this trait, kind of sad because she was broken, but Mordekaiser was a cool four cost carry for a while. He was like got big and just poof, poof, and you would play like four Dragon Slayer with like either Vertical Legionnaire or you would play with Nightbringer, and it was it was a cool comp. Um, as far as like some of the other melee units, right? Jax was a comp that was played a lot. You go Vertical Skirmisher because it just gave you a bunch of AD over the course of the round, and you'd get to kind of do cool stuff like that. I will say, I think one of the coolest things to come out of set five, uh, like as far as player adjustments went, is that it was the first set, at least in my understanding, where anyone ever frontlined uh, backline units, like as a, as a way to play them or like like front two road them. Cause frontline Draven and second row Draven became a very popular way to play him. Cause he was three, he was three range and they don't print three range units anymore, but three range units were the worst. They would constantly walk up. They would like do this, have weird pathing, um, they do all this weird stuff that made them pretty hard to put in the fourth row. And so people started either frontlining him or putting him in the second row to try to get the, basically like get the most value out of his ability. And so his ability made, was that he had to catch his axe and then he'd do a bunch of extra damage, right? And so he'd basically always catch his axe if he didn't have to walk. And so first and second row, Draven became really cool, became a big thing rather. and was a very cool adaptation to a unit that ostensibly should be put in the back line. So it was a very, very cool thing. Um... There's some other weird pathing things with like Kindred, for example. This is a five cost Kindred, and basically you'd get a little summon of Wolf. And Wolf would dash back to Kindred every now and then, who was a ranged unit, and Wolf was a melee unit. And when Wolf dashed back to Kindred, the enemy units that were targeting Wolf would follow Wolf. And so you'd see people's back lines just like walk into their front lines, and there was some crazy stuff you could do with that. But not super healthy for the game, I would say. Just it was an inter interesting interaction. But a lot of this was like a lot of the comps were just kind of verticals, right? Like, it was a vertical Dawnbringer. You could play, like, four Dragon Slayer with stuff. You could play vertical Nightbringer, vertical Forgotten, vertical A-Bomb, a vertical Skirmisher, uh, vertical Redeemed. Redeemed was kind of neat. Um, this got a lot cooler in 5.5, I think, but, like, Belkaz was just his big beam thing. There was, and, and this is one of the craziest comps of the set, maybe, uh, it has a various names, has a, a multitude of names. Uh, I will go with the... What is he even called? I think it's called Bulldozer is what it was. I was trying to think of the P the PG name. I think Bulldozer is the PG name. Where you would play this Varus who would basically just like, he would ult uh, and like a little AoE in front of him. And if any of your units were in that AoE, they would get a bunch of on-hit damage for a bit. And so what this Pantheon did is you'd play these two together. And his Pantheon, when he ulted, he would like start, you know, poking his spear out of his, out from behind his shield. And every little tick of that didn't do a lot of damage, but did apply on-hit effects. And so you'd play, you'd basically just play Varus Pantheon, and then Pantheon would like get this on hit effect from Varus and just like destroy boards, like destroy front lines. As he was applying Varus's on hit effect so much. That was really cool. That was actually one of the coolest comps I think come out of this set, and like one of the coolest interactions you've seen between units. Um, kind of similar thing with, or not similar thing rather, but um, similarly like disappointing part of the set with was Draconic, uh, where it was just, so it was the econ trade of the set, and it was the first instance of like, golden egg is going on benches but it just it felt funky i think it, it never felt great um some people would try to reroll udir uh i'm not going to name names but rather unsuccessfully because it wasn't a very good reroll set actually became a really big thing to reroll for a while um ash as well there were like some weird reroll things going on with it but it didn't really do a lot and like the eggs were awkward and it was just a weird econ trade overall it wasn't like you know a fortune or an underground or a heart steal or anything it was it was worse than that for sure so that is to say that the comps in general were like a little one note there were some cool ones again but they weren't amazing and a lot of them were very very much uh <laughs> they were very very much kind of identified by what broken interactions they had with shadow items so why was set five bad uh why was set five really weird and and not so great a couple i mean we went over a lot of them it was more than one reason right but i think it all kind of harkens back to shadow items they're basically what they did is they they were impossible to balance more or less right you couldn't really balance all this stuff because there's just too many items to look at and too many weird interactions to try to think about um, they made comps like very reliant on certain items. So like that, that felt really weird. The meta just felt very stiff, very stale. 
Um, there were a lot of bugs as well. I, I, I'm not gonna, I, I don't know if I can remember any right off my bat, right off the bat that were like very, very bad, but there were, maybe there was like a weird iron bug for a while where like he would summon Daisy on your own backline, I think is what it was. And he would just like start killing your own backline. I think it was one bug that was happening for a bit. There, there were basically like a lot of, a lot of little issues and there were so many that they couldn't really solve all of them. And it just made the set feel really weird. I think it, it there were certainly moments where set five felt fun and, and felt good, but shadow items just made it too tough. So that is probably the worst set of TFT of all time, but we're going to talk about more sets of TFT because I want to get to this best set of TFT of all time eventually, which I won't spoil it here, but if you know, you know. Um, but yeah, we're going to keep talking about sets of TFT in the future. I hope you enjoyed this little walk down memory lane. Um, yeah. Bye-bye.